Shalom Chavri, I'm Stephen Benun. You are watching Israeli News Live here on uh, YouTube as well as our live stream broadcast. It airs on Roku Television as well. Just a quick reminder of those of you that do want to catch it on Roku, all you have to do, go to Roku on your television set, uh, download the live stream app, then search Israeli News Live and you can catch it there as well. I keep bringing this up mainly, guys, because... We just never know how long we're going to be on the YouTube platform or, for that sake, any other platform, including live stream, uh, because things are changing rapidly. In fact, President Obama was uh, just speaking recently about uh, wanting to be able to overhaul the way independent news is broadcast on the Internet. So uh, things are happening at a very rapid pace. And today, again, we have our very special guest, uh, Dr. Stephen Pigeon with the uh, Sefer Group. And it is a pleasure to have you on, uh, Dr. Pigeon. Uh, I like to call him brother because we're close friends as well. But I, I, I just throw the titles in there because he spent his life being educated. So uh, I think every once in a while it's nice to get a, what do they say, a flower there, Steve, a rose rather, rather, than, rather than a whole bouquet when you're gone, right? <laughs> You know, I left school early, Stephen, when I was a teenager, you know, and uh, it happened because there was a point where the public school wanted to see me die in Vietnam, and I didn't want to die in Vietnam, so we had a disparity of interest there. And I left school when I was uh, 15 years old, thinking I'm going to get started in life early, and then I ended up spending, you know, the rest of my life in school. <laughs> so it really didn't work out as well as I thought it would. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, when, when, we, uh, when we move into, you know, the purpose of my education was uh, not to get the certificate, but to obtain the knowledge. And, you know, I just don't think, you know, if you give up chasing knowledge, you might as well just set yourself down and, and, and die. Because there's so much to know, there's so much in the world to explore, and so much to understand, you know, in meeting this edict that Paul sets out in Romans 12 too, right, to keep renewing the mind. And keep renewing the, the mind by chasing after those things which Yah has revealed to us, because He does reveal His secrets and His mysteries to those of us who are of the Torah. You know, so it, it does make it does make a big difference. Yes, it does, Steve. Absolutely. And of course, besides the doctor degrees that you have, you've also spent many years in studying the Hebrew language as well, like myself. Uh, for the sake of the project that you guys have worked on at the uh, Sefer Publishing Group. And that's just a, a tremendous undertaking in bringing back some of the uh, ancient scriptures there that have been taken from the Bible or were not even permitted to be in the current canon uh, for whatever reason that might be. So uh, we really appreciate the work that you and uh, Brad Huckins do, do there at the Sefer Publishing Group. Uh, but what I really like is your knowledge, and forgive me for the dog barking in the background, the house here in Europe doesn't have doors, uh, so a little bit of a problem. <laughs> so, so those of you watching live, uh, it seems like there's always something. Every time we come on, Steve, there's always something that happens. Well, now we got the dog. So, but uh, yeah, no, we don't. Uh, unfortunately, my office of all the places that needs a door doesn't have a door on it. So, uh, but we're not complaining. Uh, I normally have the styrofoam stacked stacked to the ceiling to kind of uh, dampen the sound, but this time I failed to put the last one in. All right. Anyway, uh, Doctor Pigeon's own not his knowledge on Russia. Uh, he's he's been to Russia, I, I want to say it like this, as a tourist many times. I, I think that would be uh, the best way to, to express that, but he has many friends there, and uh, a, a deep knowledge of the Eastern Europe as well as uh, Russia and the, and the Middle East, etc., and with the current climate, the things that are happening on a continual basis, uh, Steve, it's just important that we bring you on uh, to yet again in such a short notice because things are unraveling so rapidly with the situation with Russia. Now, many of the NATO states there have um, uh, once again, they, they have now they've gone to the extent of expelling uh, Russian diplomats. 
a lot of NATO members, including the Czech Republic, which when I brought this out about the Czech Republic, I said, I don't believe that Milo Zeman, the president, was in agreement with that. Uh, but his position is similar to that of the president of Israel. It's more of a figurehead type of status, although he does carry a lot of weight. He did come out publicly here locally and say exactly that. He says he did not agree with the expulsion of the Russian diplomats, and he's also uh, demanded uh, that the British government produce evidence. He said because they're not seeing any. Steve, kind of weigh in on these issues, please. Yeah, and they won't see any evidence either on the scripple poisoning. They just won't see any. It's not going to be forthcoming. And it's, in my opinion, it's a false flag. That's my opinion. And, and I can tell you that this joining of the expulsion of Russian diplomats is really uh, it's something else because, you know, when you have a diplomat in your country, you have a diplomat there in, in order to have a discussion before you have war. So you say, well, you know, because when you don't have someone to talk to, you can begin demonizing the other side. Well, they're probably going to do this. Well, they may do that. Well, that means this, that means that. Instead of asking them, what did you mean when you did this? And then having a diplomat say, well, this is what we meant. Oh, okay, well, maybe we won't have to nuke you. You know, and so you have some clarity. But when you expel diplomats and you say, get out of the country, that means you're done talking. And if you're done talking, then what are you going to be doing? If you're done talking, then you must be preparing for war. Now, this is the general assumption. Now, this is the general assumption. Not only is it a general assumption uh, in Russia, but it's also the assumption in China. It's also the assumption in North Korea. It's also the assumption in Iran. And all of these countries now are gearing up with anticipation for a substantial war. And you can see it everywhere. Do you think then, that, Steve, that this is one of the reasons why uh, Kim Jong-un actually met with President Xi uh, of China? It was I know that he is, uh, has a uh, planned visit with President Trump, but the unexpected and unannounced uh, trip with President Xi, we actually caught it ourselves on Twitter, uh, a motorcade headed into uh, China, had not even made it to news yet, and then did a little bit of digging and found out that he was exactly uh, meeting with the president of China. Do you think maybe he's doing that to get the reassurances from China uh, that they will have his back in the event that they become one of the targets of the NATO uh, onslaught? Well, sure. And I mean, it, it was very clear what happened with China. Uh, just a few days ago, we sent a destroyer down into the South China Sea that came within 12 miles of one of the Chinese islands that the Chinese are building. You know, basically, they're, they're building fortresses in the South China Sea in order to claim the South China Sea as Chinese territory and control the shipping. Now, I mean, that's very clear that that's the Chinese plan, and that's exactly what they're doing. Well, we sent a destroyer through there, and the Chinese considered that outrageously antagonistic, and their res response was to send 40 ships right into the same region and say, now come on back in, let's have a bloodbath. I mean, that was the response. Come on back in, let's have a bloodbath. And in the meantime, the Chinese have put 300,000 on the North Korean border, 300,000 troops. And Kim Jong-un stood up with, uh, you know, almost arrogance. I mean, he stood there and he's saying, you know, this is my friend, right? The, the head of China, and if we are close associates, we're close allies. I mean, he made it very clear. And then Chinese tanks began to be unloaded into North Korean territory. So you're seeing there's there's no question that an assault on North Korea is going to be an assault on China. They're going to the Chinese are going to take that as essentially a frontline property. Let's call it a, a keep, if you will, in front of the castle. It's a keep in front of the castle. And if it's attacked, the Chinese are, are definitely going to be responding. Now, the Chinese may initiate a response because they, quite frankly, have opened up the war salvo by establishing the Petro Yuan and establishing it successfully. And uh, so with that, the United States, you know, all of this stuff began to open on the first of Aviv, right? The first day of the month of the year, all of these things began to open. The Petro Yuan was launched. Uh, the uh, confrontation in Syria was abated, which, by the way, was, in my opinion, a significant defeat for the American forces in the Eastern Mediterranean. You know, Sun Tzu said the battle is won before the first shot is fired. And that battle was won when Vladimir Putin expressed his intent. We're not going to retreat. We're going to attack. We're going to counterattack if you launch. And 
the American, you know, we at that point, we had enough military uh, armament in the region to completely destroy Damascus. I mean, there was no question. It was overwhelming force. We would have totally destroyed Damascus, completely destroyed the Assad regime, and all tenets thereof. It didn't happen. And it didn't happen because we were fearful of the response. We probably would have lost the 6th Fleet and the, and the Roosevelt Carrier Group. And if that would have happened, we'd have been launched into a full-scale nuclear exchange with Russia. There would have been no abatement. Now, since that, back, since that walk back, almost two weeks ago, since that walk back, we have seen some think tank people come out and say, well, you know, that was Rex Tillerson's uh, idea. That wasn't Trump's idea. And so Tillerson was pushed down the road because that was a failed strategy. And um, in addition to that, there have been people that have come out from the head of both Russia and U.S. from the nuclear uh, uh, missile control saying, well, our view has gone back to Cold War rhetoric, Cold War standard, which is to say we're only going to do a retaliatory strike. So if the Russians nuke two American cities, we will only nuke two Russian cities in response. Now, that isn't Putin saying that, and that's not Trump saying that. That is the their, their uh, delegated authorities over the nuclear weapons saying that. And so that position could change in the event a war breaks out very easily. Well then, Steve, that, that brings it back then to the, probably the question that a lot of people would wonder about at that point is, uh, if this is not Putin, this is not Trump, then you definitely have a deep state, perhaps in both countries, in Russia as well as the United States, because if someone else is talking about a tit-for-tat type of uh, scenario, then there's something different altogether going on. Well... You know, again, the tip for tap, again, I don't think that the, I don't think that the Russian voice was contradictory to Putin. In other words, Putin came out and said, look, uh, you know, this is our position in terms of use of nuclear weapons, and his deputy, uh, correspondingly, agreed. His deputy agreed. And so, with that being said, I'm glad to see that the uh, styrofoam is going up all over the dog's uh, discussion was helping this what do you do anyway let's continue as we talk about this because i do think uh the deep state the question is whether or not there's deep state operatives in russia right whether or not there's deep state operatives in russia now with the deep state in russia uh, i don't believe so i mean you have a deep state pulse in russia and the deep state pulse in russia used to be represented by what they used to call the Russian Mafia. They now call them the Russian oligarchs. Uh, are there still Russian oligarchs? Well, of course there are. But are they in uh, obeisance to Putin? Yeah, they are. Because if you're not, you'll end up in a prison in Siberia like Mikhail Khodorkovsky. And uh, so you see that uh, there. But those oligarchs still have a great deal of authority. That is to say, they can move at any time against uh, uh, against Putin. If they could organize around the Russian military, they could move. And you can see that the chances of that happening in Russia right now are very, very slim. There was a communist leader who asserted himself for the presidency in this recent election, and he guarded 11% of the vote. And he had the, you know, he had the Stalin mustache and everything going, right? But he was only able to achieve 11% of the vote. And even with that kind of charismatic look, charismatic leader, that kind of approach, there's still very little support for the return of communism in Russia. So what they practice in Russia is they practice a state capitalism, which is very similar to the state capitalism in China. I think China actually has it affected a little better than Russia. But what you're seeing is you see the state controlling the means of production for the most part. But they have independent authorities, like, for instance, Roman Abramovich, who's controlling Gazprom and who's also controlling the largest oil supplier in Russia. Roman Abramovich is not part of the government. He's an extremely rich Russian. But Abramovich says, look, yeah, I'm very rich, but here's my yacht, and he builds the largest yacht in the world, and uh, Vladimir, you can use it, and everybody in the Politburo can use it. Of course, we don't have a Politburo anymore, we have the Duma. But everybody in the Duma can use it, and all the upper class and the political elite can. Or you're welcome to get on my yacht and go wherever you want. Right? 
So you see that Obramovich, unlike Khodorkovsky, did give obeisance to Putin, so he still remains an oligarch. So is there a deep state in Russia? Unlikely. Unlikely. They have, that's interesting. Uh, they have, Th they that's have interesting, Obama. Steve, because I, I did not know that, but... You know, when you watch the way Putin does things, it does seem like that he is the one and only leader of this country. Uh, because once he says something, you never see him step back, change his mind, uh, come up with a new way of talking about something. Uh, whereas when President Trump comes up and says something, you know, the next day, if it's not something that goes along with the, uh, the deep state agenda, it's like he's a dog on a leash, a jerkish chain, he barks a different sound. Uh, and, and especially like when he met with Putin, we saw this, you know, he, he's, he comes out, he says, uh, as soon as he meets the reporters, great guy, wonderful guy, I think I can work with this guy. And then the next day he's talking about, uh, well, you know, he took Crimea and I think that uh, we can't have this. We just can't have this. And it's a totally different tune. It lets you know he's not in control as a president. Right, and when we talk about that not in control, let's talk about who is in control, okay? Now, I think a lot of these orders are coming out of London, okay? A lot of these orders are coming out of London, and people think, well, a lot of people have the conception, and they were taught in elementary school, gee, the Americans fought the Revolutionary War in 1776, and we became a free and independent, independent nation. Well, we didn't. We did not. <clears throat> We were given a certain amount of room on a leash in order to become the attack dog. I mean, that's what they were creating. They were creating uh, a military machine here in North America that would have a uh, better defense, if you will, than a military machine in Britain, which now could be destroyed with a single bomb, right? America would be a little bit more problematic, but have we broken free of the crown? No, we didn't. If you go back and you look at the agreement between the United States and King George in 1783, where we agreed to pay back 45 million debt, 45 million dollar debt. Now that agreement gives one interest rate, but the true interest rate was 30 percent, 30 percent of the 45 million dollar debt. Now, when you see that, then you see the adoption of the Constitution in 1789. The Constitution was adopted in order to lock the 12 colonies that adopted the Constitution. Rhode Island came in later. The 12 colonies that adopted the Constitution were locked into what? paying back the debts. Otherwise, Washington and Jefferson, Madison, etc., the revolutionaries would have been responsible for the debt. But Washington succeeded in pushing, Washington succeeded in pushing, uh, anyway, Washington succeeded in pushing the debt off onto the colonies. And he succeeded in pushing the debt off onto the colonies by the agreement of the colonies. And this is all found in the Supremacy Clause of the United States Constitution. And in that Supremacy Clause, uh, you can see that the very first issue in the Supremacy Clause is to require the states to be obligated to pay the debts of the Revolution. Now, when you look at the Revolution, we didn't burn London. We didn't kill the king. We didn't conquer the armies of Britain in Britain. Britain financed the war, for heaven's sakes. They financed our side, they financed the French, and they financed their own side. So once again, you see the financial capital in London causing this war to happen with its expected outcome, and the expected outcome of the revolution was not victory. It was a truce. It was a truce that allowed us to create the United States. So like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and some of the other uh, nations that were held under the British Commonwealth, we remain subject to the queen. And now the question becomes, is the queen the one who made this decision? Is the queen the one that says, we're going to war with Russia? She prepared her World War III speech, right? She prepared her World War III speech, was ready to give the speech here last week. We're now at war. Well, I hate to break the news to the queen, but if this war breaks out with Russia and the Brits attempt to use any nuclear weapon whatsoever on Russia, there will not be a Britain remaining. Nothing. You know, Steve, that's interesting you say that. Someone just sent me a, um, uh, I cannot recall the guy's name, but he was a uh, man that saw visions uh, back from the 1800s, lived up, the, I think, around 1924. He was from South Africa. 
And I was reading one of his visions about what he termed to be the, the final war on this earth. Uh, and he, he said that when the war would come, one of the points that he made that I thought was very interesting, he said that it, Russia would be involved in this war and the United States would be involved in the war, but he said Britain would be totally destroyed as a result of a war uh, between uh, Russia and, of course, as he said, the Western powers, the United States, and those that had allied with them. He also mentioned that there would be uh, different nations that would ally with Russia as well. Now, he said that in the end, Germany would be probably one of the only standing nations uh, from that war, uh, and I don't want to go too much into it because I don't recall exactly all the details, but the main point is is that England would be the one that would suffer the most devastation from this. And it also made me think too, Steve, when we were together last time, uh, we spoke about the, the very idea that the Rome's agenda is to see nationalism destroyed, especially when it comes to Russia and the United States. Uh, which would only open the door to make it easier for them uh, to gain control of Israel, gain control of Jerusalem, and using an Arabic army, which at this time here kind of reminds me of the, the, uh, the crusades that were battled, and also when Rome really went uh, using the, uh, the, the Islamic nation that they had created, according to Alberta Rivera, that is, uh, that they used this particular group to kill off the true Christians that were having great success over in Northern Africa. So it's kind of ironic that they would once again go back after the destruction of, not to say a total destruction of the United States and Russia, but perhaps enough destruction, as you mentioned there, that they're talking about limited nuclear strikes. You take out two of our cities, we're going to take out two of your cities. Well, if we have anything like that happen in the United States to begin with, it will be such a tragedy for America, let alone a tragedy for Russia as well, that both nations will be broken at that point. Uh, and that would easily give the ability for Rome then uh, to go unimpeded when it comes to going against Israel with a not only a multinational uh, uh, Islamic force, but also with those NATO nations that are against Israel as well, joining with Erdogan uh, to go against uh, the uh, uh, to go against Jerusalem and to take it for the Pope of Rome. Mm -hmm. But I, of course, you know, I think prophecy ultimately supports the destruction of Rome. Yes, uh, because you know when when you talk about the whore of Babylon riding the beast, right? Now I see the beast as Islam, and they are riding the beast. We created the beast, we ride the beast, and the beast is, and the whole world will ask after this initial nuclear confrontation, who is like the beast and who can make war with the beast? And now there's 57 nations coming against Israel. But it reads in, in uh, Kizion in Revelation in uh, chapter 16, it says, well, the beast will burn the whore with fire and eat her flesh. And I think you're going to see that. That's exactly what you're going to see. Rome will not survive this either. This tripartite relationship of Rome, London, and Washington, D.C. is going to be, the, the war will be exacted against those three principalities, if you will, those three principates. That the war will be exacted against those three. They will burn with fire. And, uh, you know, this vision about Germany surviving, wouldn't this be interesting? Because... You know, the Germans, of course, were responsible for, you know, so much of the death and carnage in uh, the 20th century, always initiating a uh, force and saying, we're willing to go to war, we're willing to go to war. In fact, we define ourselves as warriors, let's get out there and fight. Okay, fine. They did that until Germany was finally reduced to absolute rubble. And when it was, the Germans, many of the Germans have repented over what happened. Uh, and uh, have tried to turn it. So you see, it would be interesting that if the Germans work their way through this and manage to survive the war that's coming. And I think there is a small chance that the war will not come to Europe. It will not come. It will come to Ukraine. It will come to Poland. It will come to Romania. It will come to the Baltic states. Right. It may. It may even come into Scandinavia as far as Norway. But it may not come into the Central Continent. It may not because of the willingness of the central continent to talk 
and uh, not be foolish about what's happening. Uh, the Brits, on the other hand, you know, you have, there's lots of discussion about the practices of the Crown concerning child sacrifice, uh, concerning the drinking of human blood, uh, concerning the practices of John Dee, you know, and the invocation of demons, and so on and so forth that goes on with the elite. The, uh, the, the current, the Coburg Geta family that is currently governing the, the um, nobility in Britain, you know, their relatives were Vlad the Impaler, also known as Dracula, in, uh, in, you know, in Romania, in ancient Romania. So, you know, you see a very interesting coalition of people claiming leadership in the West, and in the meantime, where President Trump is concerned, how many of us, there were 63 million of us here in this country that wanted to believe in him as the man who would restore the country. But, you know, if he deviates from the deep state line, even a heartbeat, well, they go shoot up a high school, uh, you know, or they go, uh, you know, uh, they go bomb something, or they shoot up a nightclub, or they shoot up Las Vegas. I mean, if he doesn't toe the line, then you have a radical act of terrorism on American soil immediately thereafter. I mean, and it's just that fast and just that quick. So the question is, who is directing this line? Who is saying we must have this? Now, I think there are a number of parties that are responsible here. Uh, one of the parties is the chief creditor to the United States of America. Now, a lot of people think the chief creditor to the United States of America is China. That's simply not true. China maybe at one time had exposure of about three and a half trillion to the United States. That's peanuts compared to the amount of money that Saudi Arabia has put into the United States. Saudi Arabia is by far the largest creditor of the United States. You don't see that those numbers are articulated on paper because the Saudis have requested that it never be, uh, you know, uh, uh, declared as a sum total. And this Prince Salman, who is now the king, can exercise a great deal of authority, and he has expressed a willingness to embrace ecumenicalism with the Pope. Uh, just wow. recently. Now that's and, something uh, I did not even know. Yeah, he has. Uh, he is. So they're talking about putting Christian churches in Saudi Arabia. Now, there's no Christian church in Saudi Arabia. There's no Jewish synagogue. Period. Now, this must this Bible must be to. then when when Trump and and um, when Trump and Netanyahu were discussing uh, this one state deal in Israel and how that they would be working with the Arabic neighbors. Uh, of course, you know, they are Sunnis, uh, and that's always been the, 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 the arm of the, of the Muslim faith that is loyal to the Vatican to begin with. And of course, was it, was it Pope Francis or Post, Pope Benedict that actually went to Saudi Arabia and met with the, uh, the crown prince there? I forget which one. It was several years back, quite a few years back, actually. I, now. I think it was Francis, actually. Francis is the one who has prayed in mosques, right? Yes. He took his shoes off and prayed in the mosque in Istanbul, and he has prayed in other mosques, and he has invited imams into the Vatican to give Islamic prayer in the Vatican in this expression of ecumenicalism. Now, there's another expression of ecumenicalism that you brought up previously, which is that the only lawful, quote-unquote, Christian religion in China is Catholicism. Now, China had a robust evangelical movement going on uh, during the early part of this century, and there were over 300 million what we would call Protestant Christians, if you will, in China. That made it the, the single largest Christian nation on earth. However, the Chinese have been cracking down on those churches now. They come in and they blade churches. If you build a building, they just blade it, knock it down, tear it down. And they have you know, been punishing the congregations, and people have been put in jail. Not the kind of punishment that was exacted against Falun Gong, which was, you know, people were exposed to live human transplants and everything else out of that organization. But Catholicism continues to be an approved religion in China. That's different than in Russia, where Catholicism is not approved at all. In fact, you would have a hard time finding a Catholic church in Russia. Uh, I remember when I was in the nation of Georgia, Gruzia, they call it, when I was in Georgia, uh, there was one Catholic church, and we went to visit this Catholic church, and uh, we went in the doors, and of course what you see is you see a mural behind the altar, and here is a painting of Mary ascending, and the apostles praying to her. 
And of course, you know, this was all about Miriam worship, Mary worship. And over here on this wall was uh, an you know, eight by 10 black and white photo of Mashiach, right? So he does have room in this church on an eight by 10 over here on the left wall. But in the, but, but in the mural, it's Mary, Mary rising, right? And, uh, you know, so it shows you. And then even then there was a recent, there's been a movie released here in the States. You know, I can only imagine it's the name of the movie based on the song. And at the end, the Pope gives a message. And he gives a message, and it's going along fine. And then he finishes up his message with what? You know, baking bread to the Queen of Heaven, right? He offers the sacrificial way for the kivan to the Queen of Heaven. And so a lot of people don't understand that, particularly people who are in, in the Catholic Church. But, you know, that, that term kivan in, in, in the Hebrew, which you find in Jeremiah, talking about, you know, bake, baking bread to the Queen of Heaven, that kivan is actually a sacrificial wafer, a sacrificial wafer. And uh, so you see the sacrificial wafer in, in the centerpiece of Catholicism as they break the wafer in obeisance to the Queen of Heaven. And uh, so all of this stuff kind of comes together, this ecumenicalism, if you will, is coming together to show that you see participation. Well, the countries are aligning here militarily. The Pope is behind the scenes making allies spiritually. He's making allies spiritually to people who are willing to bend the knee to the Vatican, to Rome, and to its serpent head uh, audience hall, right? Well, you know, that's what we brought out the other uh, the other day on a broadcast I did on Israeli News Live, uh, was the going back, and it's actually a part of the book that I'm writing now, um, I was looking at what the, the, the timeline, actually, Steve, where the Pope of Rome was, was very thorough in the way that he was planning on taking his role as king um, in this world, usurping the authority of Christ. I mean, we know he does that in Catholicism, but he also had to do this in order to fulfill prophecy. And, and, and people might think, wow, Pope fulfilling prophecy? Yes, he does. Because in a redemption process, all of Israel has to come back to where we left God. And we left God before, Steve, before we were ever divided into two houses. Before there was a house of Judah, before there was a house of Israel. And you can literally go back further than that. You go all the way back to the time of Mount Sinai with Moses, when God wanted to come down before all of Israel... And he wanted to make himself known to us. He wanted a personal relationship with us then. And the tribes were too afraid. They said, let not God speak to us lest we die. Let him only speak to Moses. That was the real rejection. And that's one reason why God has to send Moses as one of the two witnesses. Because we have to, the, the only way to get back to God is to go back in the direction that you left God. Well, I'm going back actually to Samuel the prophet when Israel wanted a king, and they rejected God being their king, which God was using Samuel as that mouthpiece when they rejected Samuel the prophet, because God says to Samuel, he said, they didn't reject you, they've rejected me as being king over them. Uh, well, 96, we know Netanyahu was elected prime minister, but it wasn't, it wasn't no small thing that uh, years before that actually happened that Mike Evans who also is very uh, pro-advocate for the ecumenical movement with the Pope of Rome, uh, but he had anointed uh, Netanyahu and, and prophesied over him that he'd be prime minister not once but twice over Israel. Now, I, always, I used to really believe that this was something of God until I began to start looking at the pieces of the puzzle as they were coming together, and then I began to realize that maybe there's more to this than meets the eye. Um, so as I was looking at the Pope of Rome in his time where he fulfills Obadiah's prophecy in verse 16 where they drink upon God's holy mountain, Mount Zion, which he did the communion service there in 2014 and during Passover, you have to look at the sequence of events. One, the house of Judah representing three tribes, the, the Levites, Benjamin, and Judah, had to legally permit the Pope of Rome to come on Mount Zion to hold that communion service, which is where he also put his 
uh, his crown on, or his might, what do you call it, mitre, mitre, something like that, Steve. Uh, he puts this on, which is officially his crown, even though he did wear his little yarmulke in there going in there, which they don't call theirs a yarmulke, but he wears that. Uh, but he does, when he does the official part of this, he puts on the crown and sits on the seat. The only time he sits on the throne there, which is right, the, the upper room is seated directly over the tomb of David. So in that case, he was taking his place as the, as the king of Israel. But here's the thing though, Steve, in order for prophecy, in order for redemption to fulfill itself, we have to go back where we left God. And it was with Samuel the prophet. That was the first place that has to be corrected. Now, we know that Yeshua comes. Yeshua does, uh, you know, he is the, the king of Israel in a human body of flesh. Now, we realize that. But what happened, the reason that was never fully fulfilled when he was here the first, the first time when the Messiah came was because, one, the house of Israel was in captivity. And even though he says to his apostles, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, we still, we didn't have our Elijah that was promised of Malachi 4. Only the house of Judah got the Elijah prophet to fulfill the fulfillment of Samuel, that reconciliation there. But nonetheless, both tribes in 325 AD, we still put a pope in the place of Christ once again, uh, and still a big mess. So, but here's the, here's where, and, and I know this is really confusing the way I'm saying this. I just don't know how to say it clearly enough yet, but but anyway, before the Pope could come there, he, there was a nine-month negotiation started by John Kerry. That was Rebecca's prophecy where she has the two children in her womb, and they're wrestling with one another, and she goes to God and says, why am I thus? And the, and the Lord said, there are two nations in thy womb, two manners of people, which he saw in Jacob. That's the Romans and the Jews of today, or Israel, not just the Jews, but Israel of today, because Jacob is Israel. All right? Well, the Vatican was in negotiation with John Kerry and Prime Minister Netanyahu and Shimon Peres for being a Vatican state, which would give them the old city of Jerusalem, which was what was in the, the uh, 1948 um, uh, Resolution 181. That was supposed to have been accepted back then, but the Arabs never did. And everybody was thinking that John Kerry was negotiating for a Palestinian state, but that wasn't really the case. It was actually a Vatican state. And so when they say that John Kerry's nine-month negotiation was a failure, it was never a failure because the Pope of Rome comes within 30 days and has the, holds the mass in the upper room showing that he got Mount Zion as part of the deal of the old city. It wasn't just the old city, he wanted Mount Zion as well. But before that happened in February... This is when Tony Palmer goes to Kenneth Copeland to the ministerial meeting there about, what, three months before the Pope comes there. He had, because the, the Vatican knew in order for them to be able to go on the Temple Mount for the Pope to, to hold that place, he had to have not just the Lutherans, not just the Methodists to sign like they did back in 1999, bringing the ecumenical movement together, bringing the daughters, as you mentioned, Steve, Mystery Babylon, bringing the daughters back to the mother whore. Uh, whore. The harlots had to come home, but he was missing a key ingredient, and that's the evangelical community who has always had a major influence over Israel. So he couldn't just go there to Mount Zion without... Uh, and be unimpeded with protest by the by the the evangelical community unless he gets them on board and he did that when he sent tony palmer there and of course kenneth copeland is i, I don't know maybe he's a jesuit i have no idea i can't say he is or is not but the point was it was amazing how overwhelming the evangelical community fell for tony palmer's speech that he give and of course the pope sending his delivered message there and they fully embrace they said the protest is over and now one fourth of christendom in the modern days uh, outside of catholicism the, and the lutherans were now joined with the pope of rome and they elevated him to be king not just over the state of israel but over all 12 tribes in essence when they did that steve and mm -hmm. And when you look at that, Stephen, you know, you talk about that, uh, uh, that ecumenical movement being, over, you know, being asserted and pro the protest being over. You know, that occurred 500 years after Luther, right? 
500 years after Luther. So you had 10 jubilees that were uh, completed, 10 jubilees completed when this ecumenical uh, movement was claimed. Now, this ecumenical movement, I'll tell you, there's something I wanted to share with you. You know, the uh, when we talk about the dispersion of the tribes, one of the tribes I haven't talked about a lot is the tribe of Asher. And the tribe of Asher is a very interesting tribe because I believe if you look closely at the children of Asher, you will find the root, if you will, of the Jesuits. Okay, The Jesuits spring from the tribe of Asher. Now, Asher is very interesting because Asher occupies uh, occupied the coastland. It occupied Tyre, Sidon, and even up to Biblos. All of those, nat those were natural ports along the, that edge of the eastern Mediterranean. Because, you know, when you're in Tel Aviv, there's no natural port, right? Even yes, Yavo has a very difficult port. Uh, Herod had to build a Caesarea or Caesarea. He had to build that in order to have a port there, because otherwise it's just a flat beach all the way up until you get to Haifa anyway. But you do see a natural port in Tyre and Sidon and in Biblos. Well, Asher was the one that occupied those port cities, and they occupied those port cities on behalf of the tribe of Don, who was sailing in the Mediterranean. And so all of the trade that was coming out of China, there was a Silk Road back then, there was a Silk Road coming out of Asia, and those goods were then being marketed into Europe. But the trade happened out of those cities governed by Asher. Well, Asher continues to occupy and continue to occupy the seaports of the Mediterranean. So it's my conviction that the tribe of Asher landed in the city of Venice, to give you an example, and controlled the Republic for a thousand years. Well, Venice was responsible for all of the trade out of the Mediterranean and again was the ultimate port for the Silk Road transactions. Now, that's not the case anymore. The city of dominance in Europe now is Barcelona, of course, which is a, you know the top uh, import-export city in Europe, and Barcelona sits there in the Mediterranean, and I believe that is also controlled by the tribe of Asher. Well, when you look at this, you will see that when you get into Isaiah 14, and Isaiah 14 is an extremely important, in my opinion, extremely important prophecy concerning the United States. Yeah, it's talking about, in most people's Bible it says Lucifer, but Lucifer really doesn't appear there. It's talking about a nation there. It's talking about Babel, and the home of the Kasdim, or the astrologers. The home of the astrologers. And this judgment is going to come against them, but before the judgment is done, it also comes up against Asher. Asher, right? And it comes up against Asher in verse 25, and I think you see that what's talking about is the yoke of the Jesuits is going to be broken at the same time that Babel has cast down, the yoke of the Jesuits will, will be cast down. And then a phenomenal prophecy that, that comes in in Isaiah 14, 29, talking about the Palestine, which we a lot of people would call them the Palestinians of today. But it says here, because, you know, the rod that smote you is broken, for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and its root shall be a flying seraph, a seraph, right? And from then, you see that what it says, what it says there in, in verse 32, that Yahweh has founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it. So when we talk about Mount Zion, and we talk about what's going to happen here, Rome has its plans, and the Heavenly Father laughs, okay? And so they're going to move in strict accord with what the prophecy is, to that the prophecy may be realized. Ultimately, Zion, Zion is going to be recaptured by the whole of the house of Israel, or Yashorel. Yes. And this is going to take place, and the, and the remnant, both of the tribes that you're talking about, the tribe of Israel, the tribe of Judah, those two tribes are going to be brought under the wings of the protection of the Father, even in this coming tribulation that is coming forward here. And he will restore his people to the Holy Land and to the Holy Mountain. I mean, that's going to happen. And all of this artifice and contrivance of these warmongers and people who would stand in the place of Mashiach on earth. You know, you had such an interesting thing happen, Stephen, at the crucifixion of the Messiah, right? Because you know, Pilate came out and said, look, let me present this the man to you. Here's the man, right? Here is the king of the Jews. Now, that's an oral presentment by the governing authority of the world at that time, Rome. And he presents, and he says, here's the king of the Jews. 
And then he proceeds to put on the purple robe, which was banned by Shimon Maccabee. Only the king could wear it. They put the purple robe on him, and then they put the wreath on him, the, the wreath of thorns. They put the wreath of thorns, so here's your king. Okay, that's a verbal oral command under Roman law. He was, in fact, king of the Jews at that moment. But it could be revoked by Pilate at any time. But instead, he waits. And when they put him on the cross, they put it in writing in the three languages of the kingdom, in Latin, in Greek, and in Hebrew. And, you know, so you see this I-N-R-I, you'll often see in the Roman church, I-N-R-I, right? Iesus Nazari, right? Rex, king, Iyahudia, uh, king of the Jews. But in the Hebrew, it was Yahusha Hanetzari Vemelech HaYahudim. Yod He Bab He was on the cross in the Hebrew. And so you see at this point, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees see the sign and they report back to Pilate, hey, you got to change that. Say, he said, he claimed he was king of the Jews. So, Amer Malak, right? Amer Malak. So at that point, the, this would read Amalek. Amalek. Not Malak, but Amalek. Mm -hmm. Right? But but this isn't what happened. And Pilate said, no, what I have said to you, I have said. Now, the response of the Jews to this, and this is the most important response, a lot of people say, well, let his blood be upon us is the important response. That's not the important response. The important response is, here is your king, what shall I do with him? And the response was, we have no king but Caesar. Now, that is an yes. allegiance to a principality and that allegiance to that principality continues to this day. So Caesar now will come out and say, okay, I am now, you know, uh, vicarious filio dei, in place of the Son of God. And this was the claim of Constantine, who exalted himself as a god in Rome and in Constantinople. And he is the first apostle of the Catholic Church. There's no apostolic succession from Kepha, Peter, or from Paul, you know, yes. in the 29th chapter of Acts, which appears in the Ad Sefer, you find out Paul didn't die in Rome. Paul went on to Spain like he said he was going to do in Romans, like the moratorium fragment says he did. He went on to Spain, he went on to Britain, preached at Mount Lud, Mount Lud, because London was formed by the Lydians, the Lydians who were one of the sons of Shem, formerly the Trojans, went and formed Lud, the city of Lud in London, he preached on Mount Lut, and that's where the Church of St. Paul is to this very day in London. And so, the, you know, chapter 29 of Acts delivers the rest of the story. Kepha, Peter, died in Babylon. He never went to Rome. He never went to Rome. So the apostolic succession in Rome is Constantine, the first pope. And it goes from there through those Caesars until the political power is gone and you arrive at Pope Damasus. And of course, so, as we know, the popes took on that same title, Vicarious Filiadea. Uh, they also take on that title. But you know what's what's interesting, Stephen? You bring out such a good point on this about uh, Yahshua and what he did is when when the Roman government put that crown of thorns on his head, when they when they put the robe on him, and they declared, "This is your king." As I brought out just recently, and actually I put this in this book I'm writing as well, um, I made the notation on there. It you know that even Pilate seemed to have a better revelation of who Christ was than the Jews did of that day. This was not just any king; that every everything.